trying to get started. Uh, technical difficulties. Some of us, that is our struggle. Perhaps before we start, uh, allow me to pray. Um, just Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for um, allowing us to have this opportunity. May you be with us. May you speak to us. May you speak through us. And just give us a good time together. Um, and allow us to... And from each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, my name is Mufoyo Wakilonzo. I volunteer at Tanari Trust. Uh, I have a long standing love affair uh, with Tanari Trust. So, Karibuni, uh, I can see some guys are starting to join. Um, today, we are just going to be talking about asking and listening. Uh, and uh, maybe some of you might ask why this particular topic. Uh, it's a topic in our parents' manual which I'll just continually uh, reference. Um, and also will be made available to you if you'd like to purchase a copy um, at the end of this video. I'm sure um, some of the comments will uh, lead you on to how to get that book. Uh, but why asking and listening? I've been reading an interesting book. I read it a while back, then I picked it up uh, just as we are going through this interesting season. It's Finishing Strong. Uh, very cool book by Steve Farrar. Uh, speaks about men in ministry. Um, and one of the three pitfalls of guys in ministry who, well, don't finish strong is one of the reasons why they don't finish strong is that they end up neglecting their families. One of the three stumbling blocks. Uh, so I just thought this would be an interesting topic to discuss uh, while we have a few minutes. So asking and listening, especially in this uh, interesting season. Um, as youth workers, as probably parents who are watching, maybe even as a young person, we can just talk about what are some of the challenges that we face um, and also what are some of the things that we, uh, pitfalls that we have in our relationship with our young people. So asking and listening. Uh, for me, I find that it is interesting in this uh, day and age where we have technology such as this and we are able to communicate in so many ways, unlimited ways. We can use Facebook, uh, we can use so many platforms, different platforms, but it's a struggle to communicate with our young people. Um, so what are some of the reasons why this does not happen? We'll be looking at that in a short while. But again, i uh, just like to promote some of our material. Uh, Rope's Parents Manual, um, and it's an interesting tool. It's not just a parents manual, for rights of passage, which is one of the programs that we run as Sonari Trust, but it's really a teen parenting principle book. So if you'd like to get your hands on that, again, Tanari Trust will be very willing to provide you some copies. One of the things that is a barrier to um, teen communication between parent and child or between even youth worker and child, one of the things that uh, we have seen is that young people have a perception of who we are. Um, based on our interactions uh, and sometimes even based on the different experiences that we have. Um, as parents, uh, these young people are constantly observing our marriage um, and we found that this is an interesting thing. We, uh, and if you look back at your own upbringing, probably you knew when your guardians or your parents were not together or they were not on the same page or they were having some struggles. Young people are very observant. Um, so this is something that we need to be constantly aware of as something that can impede uh, our communication. Teens observe us. Um, also, they are very observant and in terms of um, our own perceptions of ourselves. One of the things that we find as youth workers, as Christians, is that we end up at some point being hypocritical. And I know this is, it's not something that we want to tell our young people, but it's true, we are sinners um, saved by grace and sometimes we fall short but it's interesting to see how parents react to their young people when they fall short or us in positions of authority as adults react to our young people when they fall short sometimes this is something that is a barrier um, to communication with our young people uh, the authors of this book give a scenario where um, the teenager was going through a rebellious stage. Uh, and one day they raised an issue with her. Uh, and the authors are Nzaya Akata and Bidhe Akata, uh, together with Momo uh, Musembi. 
um, and Rosalyn Keegan, who helped author this particular manual. And they, she, the teen was going through an issue, um, and the parents were really, you know, on her case. And she remarked something that really shook the father. She said, Dad, you are so self-deceived in many ways. Uh, our young people observe our hypocrisy. Uh, and so when we are coming to question them, uh, perhaps also come acknowledging that you are also um, a sinner and you fall short. Um, Henry uh, Frederick Emel says, Our greatest illusion is to believe we are what we think we are. Um, Psalms also speaks about this um, saying, But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Many times we are not able to discern our own um, errors. Also our listening habits, which is really what we are going to be talking about today. Um, Perhaps uh, there's a very interesting tool that I'd want to share. Uh, probably I'll share it as a post um, after this. Then you can just see where you are talking about the different types of listening habits. Uh, but one of the ones that we are very guilty of uh, is as parents, as youth workers, we don't listen to our young people. We're very quick to interrupt, very quick to jump on them. You know, they're sharing about a particular story and you're very quick to input yourself uh, in that. And here we also talk about lack of empathy. One of the things that they observe or they experience, young people observe or experience from us. Uh, one of our counselors shares a fascinating story when you think about empathy and really helped us put youth ministry into perspective. She shares of uh, an older man uh, who called her one, one night um, and she's a counselor, she's a professional counselor, a young lady. Um, her name is Masi. Uh, Allah probably will ask her to come and share some good tips uh, while we are here. Uh, during this corona season. Um, but she shares the story of this older man who calls in the middle of the night, wakes her up and he tells her, Mercy, I'm very sad. I'm feeling very low. Uh, my dog has died. Uh, and for many of us, when we hear such a story, it's, it's something that does not resonate with us, particularly in African traditional society. For us, dogs are really something that, you know, run around out there. Uh, but in sharing this story, and Marcy being a counselor, she did one of the things that we will be talking about today, which is asking and listening. So asking questions. She asked many questions around this. What, what is the meaning of this dog to you? Why are you so distraught about the loss of an animal? And the man proceeded to explain that in losing this animal, um, it's not just a dog. He breeds dogs, and this was his biggest breeder. So in essence, he's not talking just about the loss of a dog. He's talking about the loss of his business, his business is going down because now he has to restructure his business. And doesn't that change the perspective of how we approach communication with our teens? Many times they'll come and they'll tell you something like, you know, dad, mom, um, my boyfriend uh, has left me, or I like this guy, or I like this girl, and she doesn't seem to be interested in me. And our first response, we don't hear what they're saying. We're very quick to jump in when we say, ah, you don't worry, you know, I mean, me, I liked three girls, they left me, you know, I had issues with girls, but I'm okay, you know, I met your mother. But you're not really hearing what they're saying. Um, so some of the things that we have to start thinking about, some of the things that our young people perceive or experience about us, lack of empathy. Also, we tend to pull rank, um, you know, and we've all experienced this, uh, hey, I'm the boss. Listen to me, I'm your father. Um, you have to listen to me. I'm in a position of authority. But we're not really explaining to them why they have to listen to us. What are the reasons why we are telling them not to go there? Uh, to think about, as we talk about asking and listening, one of the biggest ones that we, that we do as Christians is hiding behind the Bible. Um, as well, saying, this is what the Bible says. And we're not really explaining what does, why does the Bible say, what exactly does the Bible say, um, or even when, in some cases, was this uh, said, um, and we just throw that out there as a defense mechanism for us not to address difficult topics, perhaps like sex, sexuality, uh, perhaps like substance abuse, um, and these are the things that are going on in our society. Uh, sometimes one of the things that also young people uh, perceive or experience um, from us or from our interactions with us also is that we are very quick to condemn them. Uh, so sometimes they don't uh, necessarily approach us because they feel that they will be condemned. Uh, and that's what they have found constantly from our relationship. So when they're going through a difficult time, uh, they're not able to approach us. 
One of the things that struck me when I was just reading all this content is that the family should be a representation of God, um, working together harmoniously. But even as a representation of God, I was thinking about this idea of how we, God, um, when we are fallen, when we are struggling, when we are sinners, um, shouldn't that be what we get from our family? Uh, shouldn't we be able to come and tell our family when we are struggling uh, with whatever it is as a young person, from sexual whatever it is that we are struggling with, from even issues of depression, which is a big thing now that is going on, shouldn't the family be a representation of God where we don't receive condemnation, but we receive grace when we approach his throne of mercy. Um, and I love um, that, for me that was something that really stood out and I love that. One of the things that finally as I wrap uh, this bit up about perception and um, experiences with our young people that really hinder our communication, our asking and listening habits, one of the things that really is big, uh, and we see this in African traditional society, is that as, yeah, as adults we are not able to manage our emotions. Um, think about many of our African traditional fathers. Simba, Simba, Akingia, you scatter in one way. Uh, you don't want to spend any time with him. When he growls, uh, you respond, yes sir, yes sir. You know, uh, we're not able to manage our emotions. When we are angry, we really beat down and berate our children. Uh, when we are happy, really, we, we, when we're not able, even able to express that with our, with our young people. So they don't even handle us. And thinking about this representation of family and God, uh, perhaps this is something that we should strive to change. Um, and again, uh, not just in trying to promote our material, but one of the reasons why I love this manual is that it, it takes the form of questionnaires. So as adults, we're able to just look at a questionnaire and we're able to just understand where are we, where are we struggling, where are we doing well, what can I do better? Uh, so it takes the form of, of those questionnaires and I'd, I'd love for you to be able to go through some of these. Ask questions. Uh, I can see many of our staff members are online. I can see uh, our executive officer is also online. So please ask questions. Let's talk about some of the things that we have struggled with. Uh, perhaps in our relationships while we were growing up, perhaps in even just as we are raising our, another generation, what are some of the things that we struggle with when it comes to asking and listening uh, to our young people? What are some of the challenges that we've observed others go through uh, when it comes to asking and listening? Why should we ask and listen? Um, Proverbs 20 uh, verse 5 gives a very good scripture. It talks about the purposes of a person's heart are deep waters, but one who has insight is able to draw them out. Uh, and here, um, the writers of this manual, uh, together with Anari Trust, were able to just reorganize this scripture a little bit and paraphrase it and say the purposes of a teen's heart are deep waters, but the parent or the guardian who has insight draws the teen out. Uh, that is Proverbs chapter 20 verse 5. Communication is an expression of the nature of the relationship. Uh, if there is good communication, then it is a good relationship. If there is poor communication, for sure it is not a functional relationship. And the responsibility of this communication is on the one who controls those conversations, who is a parent. Um, this is your job, your God-given role. You are the one who has insight. So you must draw the teen out, uh, draw the purpose of the teen, um, these deep waters that we are talking about. Asking questions just to help them process uh, what they are going through and help them draw their own conclusions. Uh, it makes much more sense and it, it, they are able to remember much uh, for a longer duration um, if they are able to come to their own conclusions that are biblically based, that are the right values. If they are able to get that, they are on their own by you guiding them, then it makes much more sense than you telling them, don't do one, two, three, A, B, C. Jumping into the gist of our content for the day. And again, I just urge you to just ask some questions as we are going through this. Perhaps if you have some issues that you would want to, um, for us to engage you with, uh, I'm not saying uh, gurus in this, uh, I'm not saying that we have vast knowledge. No man has a monopoly of knowledge. But if we work together, we are able to just uh, assist one another in one way or another. James chapter 1, verse 19 to 20. Um, this will be our focus. Uh, and is one of the key scriptures that is used 
when we think about asking and listening. Uh, James chapter 1 verse 19 to 20 says this, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Uh, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness of God. And I'll repeat, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Does this apply to the way we work with our young people? Um, and what, we'll just break this down a little bit and then we can uh, try and get some questions um, uh, from uh, both the staff and from uh, yourselves as our audience. <clears throat> what does it mean to be quick to listen? Uh, and for me, this is mainly focused on understanding, being quick to listen. I remember a situation, and I share this example often, uh, with one of my good friends who is uh, a peer of my father. Um, and his daughter, who was a friend of ours, was going through a difficult time. Uh, and we ended up being with her through that uh, day that she was going through a very difficult time. And she was feeling fairly suicidal. Um, and uh, we sat with her and we talked with her. And uh, we were just in the process of trying to calm her down, trying to help her uh, just process what she's going through. Uh, but her dad calls. Uh, and because she's not in a place to speak, I pick up the phone. And he knows me, he knows my dad as well. Uh, and he's really upset and he wants his daughter home at this particular mo moment. But we know what is going on because we're with her. And because we cannot explain it too well to him, we ask him for patience. Please bear with us. We need to just deal with something and then we'll bring her back home. But he's very upset. And he tells me, Mofoy, how can you tell me, you a young man, that you're not bringing my daughter home and I want her now? Um, and he kept calling, kept calling, and he kept trying to just calm him down. But he was very upset. And he, eventually we took her home uh, when things had calmed down. But he responded in a manner that was not, um, I would say at that point, Christian. <laughs> I hope he's not watching. <laughs> but I would say at that point, not Christian. Uh, not trying to understand what he was going through. When I met him in church um, a few uh, weeks later, I saw him walking down and, uh, you know, you can't avoid, you've seen each other and you can't avoid each other. And I thought, this man is going to kill me because last time I met him, he was so upset he couldn't even talk to me. Um, but as I approached him, he embraced me and he says, thank you. And he says, you know, I could have lost my daughter at that particular time. I didn't understand what she was going through. In fact, he responded very poorly uh, in that day, um, that particular day when she got home. The way uh, often our parents uh, respond, in anger. Uh, but someone is feeling suicidal and you are responding in anger, pushing them away instead of drawing them near. Perhaps just trying to be a bit better. An amazing man, of course, uh, and I love it when uh, parents are able to admit that they made a mistake. And he did admit that he made a mistake on that particular one. But thinking about being quick to listen. Listen to their nonverbal cues. Look at them. Look at their body language. What are they saying? Look at their emotions. Look at their facial expression. Are they really convicted about their position um, is there a sense of urgency in their tone listen to those nonverbal cues also observe unusual events particularly the teenagers and their emotions you know you can call it kind of like a seesaw uh, but observe unusual events perhaps they've been doing very well in school and now they are really doing poorly those are some of the things that we're talking about when we're talking about being quick to listen um, perhaps there were friends that you used to see every day and now you no longer see them what happened uh, Observe these things. Ask some questions around it. Perhaps they are really going through a difficult time. Uh, and in our lack of understanding, um, we are very quick to get angry. Why are you just failing? I remember our parents telling us, how can you fail maths? It's just board math. And you're looking at some of those equations and there is no board math here. <laughs> uh, maybe I was alone in that uh, as a struggler with maths. Um, but part of being quick to listen, as we're told in James chapter 1, verse 19 to 20, uh, we are trying to draw out what is unsaid. And this takes time. Uh, when they tell you that, you know, Dad, I really like this uh, girl, or as a girl who likes this boy, what is unsaid? Uh, that statement can be small, but there could be a huge, um, there could be some huge issues at the back. We have not asked questions about how old is this guy as a teenager? Is he an adult? <laughs> There's a lot that can be unsaid, and this takes time, uh, and it takes effort on our part. So we have to just continually be very quick to listen. 
I shared the story of the dog and uh, we'll share that even on our on our we'll try and share that even on our page really changing the perspective of empathy empathy is just trying to put yourself in their shoes um and this is a man and woman of understanding uh kuna mtu amesema niongeze sauti kidogo so I'll try and speak louder uh, I hope that is a bit better uh, maybe the devil is getting in the way najua corona kinyozi kumefungwa anyway showing empathy um trying to put ourselves in their shoes try and remember your own upbringing as well um trying to understand what is really going on sometimes we even have to physically go to where they are uh, as a young person so for us to hear better we have to go to really where they are seated where they are uh engaging with other people their environment their comfort zone for them to understand that we are willing to invest in this relationship uh, but also it takes uh, a bit of humility um as a parent in just being quick to listen as a youth worker in being quick to, quick to listen we also have to accept rebuke from them uh sometimes they'll tell you you know dad here and here you didn't do well um and that's not easy for you to take as an adult uh from a child but really they're sharing their heart this is an opportunity for you to reach them so accept rebuke it takes you humility to accept rebuke from our teenagers um but and also one of the other ones that we love is just being uh, at a point where you can seek forgiveness uh from your young person to say i'm sorry is to acknowledge a mistake um and i love uh one of the things that m- my own father did uh for me uh just sharing how he made several mistakes in his life number one what it does for me is that it allows me to view him as you know sometimes we view our parents as people who never make mistakes so, uh they, they have this superhuman uh, thing but now that i know that he makes several mistakes he walked with us through one of his biggest mistakes he made a financial investment that he wasn't meant to make uh, and he walked with us through that process freely admitting where he f- he felt what and where he went wrong uh, but also it allows us as a young person can you imagine the, the what it does to you as a young man knowing that your own father can admit his faults so even you as a young man are challenged to be able to evaluate where did i make a mistake wow i need to apologize for that um so one of the things that this breeds uh humility breeds credibility uh it opens the door uh by leading a door to leading by influence rather um humility breeds credibility uh one of the things that we love when it comes to being quick to listen Again as I said I'll share a, a picture um a bit later on on uh, some of the different listeners that we have and you'll try and place yourself with the ones that you really do um and try and improve uh, on our listening ability. Um so we're told about being quick to listen, uh slow to speak. What does being slow to speak mean? For many of our African parents <laughs> this is a struggle. <laughs> uh we are very quick very quick to crack jokes at the expense of our uh, young people uh you know uh, many statements like one of the famous ones that mom used to say is mbona mnafanya kazi ni kama kichwa imeja supu ya malenge why are you acting like your head is full of basically nothing <laughs> uh but the bible tells us something interesting uh proverbs chapter 29 verse 20 Uh, I'd urge you to read and these are not my words but it says do you see a man who speaks too soon there is more hope for a fool uh, than for him not my words but the bible which is telling us take time to think um think about your young person what is he going through um think about what is the most appropriate response at this point uh, i remember even just in my own upbringing i share my own story because now we laugh at some of these moments i was a bit of a naughty child if you have interacted with me you can understand <laughs> but i got in trouble in school uh, and uh, you know getting kicked out of school was one of the, i can say the lowest points as a, as a child um but immediately after that i got in trouble again and this time around for real it was not my fault i was completely innocent but the teacher just having a perception of a naughty boy <laughs> uh immediately accused me instead of even asking questions around the incident and i remember going home uh and my parents were very quick to jump on me uh, and with good reason uh, <laughs> i can understand but i remember being very angry uh, angry why angry hapo imetoka kikamba yangu imetoka being very angry. uh 
at this uh, situation why are they not hearing me and it really pushed me away and i remember that day just thinking whatever you do to me i don't care and that's not where you want to get you with your young people uh, so when we respond to our teens we should measure our response perhaps even sometimes against their official expression but even just their uh, body language um, sometimes it's better to ask their opinion before we share ours so what do you think about this so you can even just get a bit better understanding of where they are uh, proverbs again speaks a lot about fools uh, and these are not my words this is the scripture proverbs 18:2 says a fool takes no pleasure in understanding but only in expressing his opinion uh, and many times as adults uh, we find ourselves there um, so try and understand where they are when we understand and we're able to address it better uh, sometimes you can even understand and think wow you're actually right <laughs> going back to accepting rebuke from our young people um, speaking at all times is also said to be inappropriate uh, sometimes we just speak 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 and spew and spew and really we have never not given them a chance and then we ask or tell them sawaenda sumelewa and they really have not understood uh, for those who have parented young children you can talk to them for 15 minutes but then when you ask them what did you understand they really didn't understand they were just mm, mm. Uh, so this is where we need to uh, you know continuously just uh, be with our young people and ask them are you understanding us from their perspective we also speak about when it comes to being slow to speak think about how we are rebuking them um, and this should not be done with threats if you don't do this i'll stop paying your school fees we have had <laughs> some of those i was threatened severely in several times to that i will be sent to the farm uh, because of my antics in school um and fair enough some of that was very warranted uh but we really want to get to a point where we can rebuke them in love um and we're not talking about making them act from a point of fear i remember some of the things and if you think about your own upbringing many of the things that we did particularly when we were home we did because we were afraid uh, as soon as the fear factor was removed you realize that you really would want to do something completely contrary to what you have been raised up to do um, so for us when we're rebuking them we're trying to help them understand why do I want you to do this and these are the pitfalls that accompany the behavior that you really wanted to do but I I'm speaking against it um we also talk about these reprimands or rebukes um it's good to rebuke once it's good to rebuke twice but when you're rebuking after that perhaps even when you're getting to a third time there should be a consequence I don't just keep shouting keep shouting keep shouting sometimes you know our, our young people know ah we are napiganga makelele tu <laughs> and there's nothing um that is you know after that they know our dad will just shout once he shouted it's done um but there should be a consequence it gets to an age perhaps and we'll talk about discipline at a later stage it gets to an age where physical discipline in terms of beating does not work uh and really you have to or even if it is there it has to be accompanied by a detailed explanation as to why you are getting this don't just reprimand uh, continuously reprimand consequences should kick in to drive more required behavior again i'd urge you to get a hold of uh, parents manual uh, rights of passage manual uh, this is the book that i'm constantly referencing when we're talking about some of these principles being slow to speak creates a climate of trust uh you're able to at least build some trust they know mom and dad will really have thought through this particular topic or they know at least when i come i'm going to be hard the last one we talk about the second last one rather being slow to anger um and why are we told to be slow to anger uh because anger does not lead to the righteousness of god that's what the word of god says that's what the scripture that we're fo- focusing on today speaks about uh you can recall many many instances when your own in your own upbringing when your guardian your parent or someone in authority was just angry for no reason um, i share the one that uh, one that i was beaten for that i uh, have not forgotten when i was in class 6 <laughs> this is many years ago uh, we had uh, a system of grading where you know you'd put the top third in one class the middle third in another class and the bottom third in another class so that you can move i think the idea was just to for people to move at their different pace the different speeds uh and help boost performance 
Uh, I ended up being in the top third, probably because, you know, I was a bit lucky. Uh, let's not say that intelligence was a factor. <laughs> anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, <laughs> Being in the top third was very interesting because you would find that the difference between your your uh, colleagues was not big, but you can have maybe three number twos and then you'll have probably a number six or seven, you know, that kind of thing. And I remember going home with number 18 uh, and uh, <laughs> we're not a big class, so that was fairly at the bottom. Um, and my parents were so upset. I was thoroughly fixed uh, because I came with such a number. But in my head, I'm thinking I did better than the previous uh, term. And I was very angry. Uh, you can probably see that I was an angry <laughs> young person. Um, but sometimes your child has a genuine concern or a genuine reason. So avoid instilling fear by frequent outbursts or expressions of anger. Um, or venting or, and, and this gives us temporary relief as adults in that you've got it off your chest but we are told to be slow to anger uh, you can imagine if god got angry thinking about the family again as a representation of uh god um you can imagine if god uh, constantly got angry at every little mistake that we made he's slow to anger um so don't instill fear Fear for me, I find, uh, particularly with teenagers, does not, they'll do what you want just for that, in that particular uh, season or session because they're afraid. But it's much better if they respect you. If they respect you, they'll do it because, you know, you're in a position of authority. They acknowledge that you um someone that they look up to. When there's respect, it's much more longer lasting. There are things I will not do till now, uh, even in my adulthood and being out of my parents home because I respect my parents and they instilled those um, in me also uh, part of being slow to anger is hearing both sides of the story um, I know some of you are, have gone through some of those seasons where someone has told you a story and you really empathize with them and then you hear the other side of the story and you're like ah, the man lied the man lied to me uh, so the ethics of scripture also tell us uh, in Proverbs chapter 18 verse 17 uh, not to listen uh, to just one side of the story. It says the first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. Uh, when you examined, when your story is examined, many times you realize, hey, the, and as human beings we love playing the victim. Um, so here both sides of the story, part of being slow to anger, we've spoken a lot about empathy. And I'll repeat the story that I shared initially that was shared by our counselor when we think about empathy. Where an old man called her about the dog in the middle of the night. My dog has died, uh, an old man tells her counselor. And for us in Africa, we are wondering why someone is waking you up in the middle of the night. Why can't we talk about this in the morning when someone wakes you up talking about a dog? But being a counselor, this is one of our friends called Marcy in Tanari. And she asked him, just ask a few questions. What was the importance of the dog? Why is this so um, relevant to you? Why are you feeling the way you're feeling? And when the man explained that he breeds dogs and his biggest breeder has died, it changes the perspective of this story. That's what we're talking about, empathy. Being slow to anger. Empathy is getting to the heart of communication. For a teen struggling with life, there's no um, more important resource than a parent capacity for empathy or an adult with a capacity for empathy. Um, and also one of the most important ones that I've seen is just sharing details uh, with our life, uh, with our teens about our life. Uh, so keep uh, sharing your examples, keep sharing your stories, keep remembering. Um, keep remembering. Uh, your own upbringing when you're working with our young people when you didn't understand how are you handled how would you like not like uh, to be handled uh, Timothy Mulinge Mateka our executive officer asks when the listening space is lost how can we redeem it uh, one of the important things that I talked about is being able to accept rebuke and being able to seek forgiveness it takes humility it takes humility to go back and tell your son I was wrong the way I handled this was very wrong um, and I think that's the, the beginning of that healing process how can we redeem it go back to your young person go and tell them hey son uh, or as a youth worker just sit down with them and tell them I'm sorry um, 
Humility breeds credibility. So that's, I think, how we can begin to redeem it. Say, I'm sorry, acknowledge the mistake, ask for forgiveness. Um, acknowledge the wrong motives of the heart. Perhaps even with the right intention, you didn't go about it the way you should have. So I love that question, but I, I, and maybe we can even share a bit more even as we uh, interact with one another. Any other questions that we would want to deal with but during this particular time. I feel like I've spoken enough and I will share some pictures to help us uh, just understand uh, how we can ask and listen to our young people a bit better. Any other questions? When the teacher asks uh, for questions and you don't respond, he feels like maybe he didn't hit the point home. <laughs> maybe you can even share some of the challenges that you yourself faced. Um, uh, maybe even just on the thread uh, below. You can share some of the challenges that you faced in your own experiences or your own perception of uh, dealing with young people. An interesting question, what was my past experience on the issue of listening? I, I really struggled with listening, first of all. As, so even when, when I was asked to do this, I, you know, it's one of those things that you talk about that is it's also a reminder for yourself. Um, for me, yeah, big, big, big challenges. It, I, I'm, I like cracking jokes. So many times when someone approaches me with an issue, I'm really thinking of something humorous to um, uh, make them laugh or just a quick comeback uh, but speaking about it from my own uh, perhaps upbringing yeah i didn't uh, one of the my issues with the adults uh, and i find we still do it even now um, i remember just uh, recently i was helping my my, my young niece here uh, with um, her homework and uh, i talked i talked for like 15 minutes um, and then shared some examples. And then eventually when I asked, did you understand? Uh, she said, no. And I said, I felt really wasted. <laughs> like I really wasted time. Um, so for me, that's one that I've seen recently. And I feel like that's really what we have done a lot with our young people. Uh, sometimes we talk too much to them, but really they have not understood because there are so many distractions around, or maybe just have a short concentration span like some of us. Um, Paul Mwanzia says, true, our share, sharing our stories uh, impacts. I once shared my story and by the time I was done, they were shedding tears and had a lot to ask. How did you come out of that? And my version changed many. Very true. In one of our programs, Rites of Passage, um, sharing this idea of sharing stories after you've heard uh, what they are going through. I remember a parent sharing about the experience. Uh, this is at camp. Uh, the experience when the child... Uh, of them having a child out of wedlock in campus and that particular child was the one in that uh, rites of passage camp probably one of the most powerful moments that i've seen for young girls when they were just hearing this lady pour out her struggles of being pregnant at 19 in first year of university in your father's house um you're now no longer you know a child quote unquote you now have to just adult you have a child to take care of responsibilities other people are out going out for dates enjoying life you now have to struggle um and it was very powerful in that the girls began to see you see now they're not just hearing abstain uh, avoid sexual immorality they're also hearing the other side of the story these are some of the consequences these are some of the challenges that can come up um this is an interesting one that uh, audrey has brought up uh, saying uh, for me it's usually hard to find a balance between sparing the rod and spoiling the child and being lenient uh, and i'd just come love to come back to this idea of rebuke uh, you cannot beat a child if they didn't understand what they did was wrong so i think the idea is to rebuke them um, rebuke them and ensure that they understand what they did was wrong and why it is wrong um, but probably the second and third time if they repeat it then now you have to discipline you know, say no. Even for a baby, you tell them no. Once they perhaps even think about the idea of a baby going to the socket, tell them no. The first time, tell them no. 
second time. Uh, and the third time is when you can now begin to bring out the road. Um, we also cannot be abused uh, by our young people. Um, we are also in positions of authority. Um, so we have to take that authority. Um, so yeah, there is a balance, um, I believe. Uh, and it's, it's not... Um, I don't know, I think it, it's something that keeps changing. There are many instances where you may just have to rely on your own, uh, the different experiences that are, you're going through. But we love the idea of being close to this book. I think this book is a really good guide uh, when it comes to discipline. So keep, keep praying as well. Um, this is not, um, you know, I'd say a static thing. You're not going to read... Um, this content and not make mistakes as we go along yeah another question that we've seen how do we listen amidst the voice the noise around and avoid juggling, judging the actions of our teenagers how do we listen amidst the noise around and avoid judging the actions of our teenagers how do we listen those are, i think that's a two-part question how do we listen amidst the voice the noise 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 around sorry um, one of the biggest things that I say is a distraction is this particular gadget. Um, I love, um, one day I was in a session with uh, Michael, yeah, um, and he talked about how he had, at that time he had a young baby, uh, just, you know, toddler, maybe three or four years old, uh, and one of the things that he would do with her uh, is just be very deliberate, and he told her, you know you have the power, when it's dinner time, um, he doesn't take calls. Like there's a, there's a specific time that he has said where he doesn't take calls. So he said, if it's a real emergency, like if someone has really called and they need to talk, he would ask her for permission. And the first few times, you know, she thought uh, he was joking. And she'd say no. And he'd actually take the phone and put it aside. Um, I think it's just being intentional um, in that way, that they know that they are the priority. So how do we listen uh, amidst the noise? I think we remove... Um, that noise or try and move away from it have deliberate time um, and try and be their cats advocate for finding your young person uh, where they are so find something that they enjoy to do just figure out what do they enjoy to do and then accompany them um, I know it will take a lot of effort um, I remember one of uh, we worked with uh, some guys from compassion and I remember one of the guys was sharing how he takes his son for pizza uh, he's just, you know, young men, teenagers, we like to eat. <laughs> as, as young men, we loved to eat and we could demolish uh, a lot of food. So, yeah, that's how he avoided, remove the noise. He would just deliberately go, take the guy out for a meal. And then they're able to talk, talk about life. And then he's able to see that you're very relatable. How do I avoid judging the actions of our teenagers? Um, some of the things that they will do will shock you. Uh, and we always tell parents, you need to be unshockable. Uh, where you sit down and you uh, provide a voice of reason, uh, a voice of authority, uh, a voice that does not panic uh, in front of the child's uh, face. But when you go to your bedroom uh, with your husband, with your wife, or when you meet uh, your uh, friends, you can then uh, perhaps uh, be shocked there. <laughs> you go tell your husband, I can't believe he did that. Um, but in front of them, we have to be very, very deliberate. Perhaps they come and tell you that, uh, you know, mom, dad, I'm pregnant, which is a reality um, that happens in this day and age. How do we handle a situation like that? You know, you can call that child all sorts of names and all you're going to do is push them further and further away even as they go through this very trying time. Or you can just reassure them that whatever happens, I'm with you. Um, I'll share a story uh, even as I try and look at what Maureen Muhongo is saying. Listening sometimes means hearing what they are saying. Uh, I have often found that young people out of, act out of in rebellion or screaming while deep down they may feel neglected, insignificant, or let me see if I can get that. Or oh, unseen. There's always a message even with that from our young people. The deeper message is there. Listen keenly. Don't treat symptoms. Find the cause. Um, yeah, that's really what it is um, there's always a message even with that silence from young people the deeper the message uh, 
the deeper message is always there. Don't treat the symptoms, find the cause. Yeah. Uh, many challenges that we are going through now, particularly with our young people, uh, stem from image issues, um, particularly again because of uh, our culture. Um, there's also quite, quite a bit uh, when we speak about issues to do with sexuality. Um, so many times is even sometimes an innocent thing like or what you might consider innocent like failing grades might be tied to that. So always try and find the cause. I love, love, love that. Um, keep the questions coming. Keep the thoughts coming. We'll read them out. We'll try and educate one another. I can share perhaps one of my uh, favorite uh, stories. Um, for those who have never read Bob Goff, please look for Bob Goff. Bob Goff is an amazing writer, um, an amazing man in general. And he writes uh, a, a very one of my favorite books called Love Does. And he shares of a man who impacted him um, deeply when he was a young man and put him on the course that he's on now. He shares a story of a guy called Randy. Uh, and Randy was kind of like, I don't know if you can call him a mentor, but, you know, a youth worker who was always around. Uh, and Bob just was drawn to him. Bob Goff shares uh, of how he was struggling as a 17-year-old and he decided, I'm done with school, and he dropped out of school. And he decided he's going to go and climb mountains and pursue uh, that lifestyle, you know, the hippie lifestyle, climbing mountains, looking for a temporary job, and that's how he's going to live the rest of his life. Uh, and he packed his bags, packed his car, of course in the US, you know, a teenager, 17-year-old, you have your own car. Um, and he went to Randy's house to tell him goodbye. And Randy had this young man... Um, and he told him, give me a few minutes and I'll be out. Uh, so he went in, into the house, he packed a sleeping bag, he packed his backpack, and he came to the door. And he told Bob, whatever happens, I'm with you. Um, so I'll go with you, I'll ensure that you've settled down, uh, but wherever you go, just know that I'm with you. Uh, and Bob thought, this guy is crazy. Uh, but Randy actually, yeah, got in the car with him and they drove to where Bob desired to go. And they spent... Uh, a few days, uh, what they would do at night is that they would sneak into campsites. Uh, so you sneak in through the back, you enter a tent through the back, you check the tents that are empty, you enter a tent through the back, you sleep, and then you have to wake up really early in the morning so you can sneak out before you're found out. And they would look for jobs during the mornings, uh, and they wouldn't find and in the afternoon they just go and climb cliffs. They tried this for a few days, and then eventually it dawned on Bob that, you know, this thing is not working. It's not as easy as I thought. Uh, and so he came to Randy and told him, I, I think I would want to go back home. And Randy just kept repeating the same thing he had been repeating the days uh, before. Whatever you're going through, wherever you're going, I'm with you. And he got in the car and Randy didn't even have to speak. He knew what the young man was going through. He just kept quiet and he drove very quietly with Bob. When Bob got home, he was dropping Randy off fast uh, and Randy tells him, uh, why don't you come in? Uh, and Bob walks into the house and he finds uh, many packages, gifts wrapped. And then he sees Randy's girlfriend run up and jump on him and kiss him and say, welcome home, honey. And then it begins to dawn on Bob that these guys had just gotten married. They're not even unwrapped their gifts. But Randy walked out of the house to be with this young man who he saw was in trouble. Um, and I love that story and Bob says well, that's one of the most foundational moments in his life because really that's what God does for us. I'm with you, Emmanuel, God with us. Um, and say, Bob continues to say that, you know, God was with us so that we can be with one another. When it comes to asking and listening, I think that's one of the most profound things that we have to show our young people. Wherever you are, I am your dad. I am your mother. Wherever you are, I am with you. Um, and I, I love that uh, story um, of trying to find what is really going on with these young people. Trying to find out how can we uh, lead them better. Any any other questions? I see Paul Monze saying, I'm still I was listening habits is something we ought to teach our kids as from a little age. Very true. Um, love, love. Yeah, that, that idea of starting when they are very, very young. Um, many of our young people, you find, have struggles as well. But also I'd say, Paul, uh, isn't it for us firstly to model this for them? Um, 
I think they'll pick up many habits from the way we act as adults with them. So if we model it well, yeah, I think they'll pick it up um, from us a bit better. Maureen Mukongo, well done. Maureen used to be uh, one of our staff at Tanari, but he's also one of our Tanari family. Uh, he's, ask, he's asking me to share about closed questions versus open-ended questions. Um, something that we use when we are trying to debrief young people, when we're trying to get information from them. What is a closed-ended question? A closed-ended question is a question where the answer will probably be yes or no, or very short in that you will not get any information from it. Are you okay? Yes. How was school? It was good. Um, versus an open-ended question. An open-ended question will lead to answers like, I feel um, like one, two, three. Uh, a, a good question, as I say, is uh, uh, how do you feel? How did you feel during the day? How did you feel when you were going through that difficult point? Um, what were you experiencing? You know, that is an open-ended question. can lead to many, many thoughts um, uh, that can be drawn out as we are trying to draw out these deep waters from our young people. So try and not ask closed-ended questions. We get a lot of those uh, questions from, uh, those answers from our young people. Unasikiaje? Mbono umenyamaza? Niko sawa. Try and, uh, you know, dig a little deeper. Try and ask some of those open-ended questions. Uh, many open-ended questions, I mean, we live in the internet age. Get online. Search for some of those questions. You'll find them there. Audrey asks, which book was that? Love Does. Uh, Love Does by Bob Goff. If you can find that, amazing, amazing book. It will change your perspective on just being uh, a bit more caring uh, in society. Yeah. Uh, I think I have exceeded my time. Uh, so if there are no other questions, uh, maybe you can even just write some of the questions on uh, our wall, uh, Tanari Trust, and we will keep responding to them. Thank you so much for your time. I have taken longer than I was asked to, but uh, stay safe. Uh, obey curfew. Obey <laughs> the, the law. Some of us have been on the receiving end of not obeying those curfew laws. So keep safe. Uh, let's try to get through this together. And we pray that our nation uh, will be well. We pray for our leaders. We pray for wisdom for them. Um, thank you so much for tuning in, guys. Um, yeah, uh, I'm sure this will probably also be on online on YouTube. Uh, and we will try and get uh, just a bit more information based off of this conversation to you. Uh, Thank you, Tim, and uh, the Tanari Trust team also for allowing me to do this um, and giving me this opportunity. Uh, yeah, hope we picked up one or two things. Uh, yeah. Goodbye. God bless.